wow, we're already to moral arguments. Wow. Wow. So before getting into specific moral arguments, I do just want to make two general remarks here. First, check out my moral argument playlist. Therein, I have videos on topics intimately related to the moral argument, as well as videos, significant portions of which are directly aimed at the moral argument. For instance, in my video, Response to Trent Horn, I go through various ways that non-theists can respond to moral arguments. All right, so that's the first general remark. The second general remark is... Check out this series index. It's called Will and Lane Craig on Morality and Meaning. It's on the blog Philosophical Disquisitions. And so basically what this person has done, he's a professional academic philosopher, and what he's done is he's taken articles published in peer-reviewed philosophy journals on the topic of morality and in particular William Lane Craig's moral argument, as well as Craig's meta-ethical theory of morality and theistic meta-ethics more generally, what he's done is he's gone through various papers published and he's basically summarized them and broken them down for a wider audience. So for instance, he covers Must Goodness Be Independent of God. This is a series about Wes Morrison's article of the same name, which looks at Craig's and Alston's solutions to the Euthyphro dilemma. Also some thoughts of, on theological voluntarism. He wrote this in response to Craig Harris debate where he offers a neglected critique of theological voluntarism. This person has also published an article in Sophia called something like the epistemological objection to divine command theory or something like that. Also, Craig on objective morality. So in here, he suggested general methodology for determining the merits of any meta-ethical theory, and he also gives a close textual and philosophical analysis of what Craig means by objective. He also has a series of articles on God and the ontological foundation of morality. So Craig insists that only God can provide a sound ontological foundation for objective moral values and duties. Is this right? With the help of Wes Morriston, once again, he tries to answer the question in the negative. So no, he's not correct. And he's drawing on the published peer-reviewed work of philosopher Wes Morriston here. And he also draws on his own insights. And then we have Divine Command Theory and the Moral Meter Stick. This is yet another series that he's done on it. So in his efforts to avoid the revised youth of a dilemma, Craig sometimes relies on William Alston's analogy of the meter stick. According to this analogy, God stands in the same relation to the good as the model meter stick stands in relation to the length of one meter. Does it make any sense? Well, Jeremy Coons argues that it doesn't. And in the series of posts, I walk through the various steps of Coons's argument. And so again, it's going through articles that Jeremy Coons has written on this regard. He also goes through stuff that Eric Wielenberg has published. Is Craig's defense of divine command theory inconsistent? He's gone through Craig's allegation that on an atheistic view, humans are quote-unquote nothing but mere animals or collections of molecules. He's also gone through what William Lane Craig says on ultimate accountability and whether or not there's a defensible account of moral value. There he looks at what Craig has written with his co-author J.P. Moreland. And again, he's drawing on the work of Eric Wielenberg, who counters that there is a defensible atheistic account of value. I would argue that there are many such defensible accounts, and that this account is no worse off than Craig and Moreland's preferred account of moral value. And then, of course, he goes through stuff about meaning in life, but we don't really need to concern ourselves with that here. Anyway, with that shout out of the way, and you guys definitely need to check this out, let us get on to the video itself. Moral arguments, uh, which take particular or general facts about morality to support the existence of God. Uh, generic argument from the objectivity of, of morality. Generally, if morality is objective, or morality can be objective only if God exists. Morality is objective, so God exists. Uh, we're all familiar. I would say premise one is false. So first, a note to give you guys some context. Very few meta-ethicists take this line of reasoning seriously. Popular apologetics is seriously out of sync with meta-ethics here. If you buy mainstream anthologies on meta-ethics, for instance, most won't even mention God and will still contain boatloads of theories accounting for morality in non-theistic terms. So there's a striking gap between popular apologetics on meta-ethics and the actual meta-ethical literature. But that, again, that's just a note. So here, now we're getting into some of the criticisms that I raise. So first, I would raise an intrinsicality objection. I think it's obvious that some things are intrinsically right or intrinsically wrong or intrinsically good or intrinsically bad. There's something in the very nature of suffering which makes it bad or which accounts for or grounds its badness. It's facts about the action of torture, what it is to torture someone, and it's facts about the victim and the various experiences that they undergo when they are being tortured. It's those facts which account for the badness of torture. It's those facts which account for the badness and wrongness of torturing. Right, what it is to torture someone and what it is to be the victim and to go undergo their various experiences, there's something intrinsic to this situation itself, which accounts for why it is bad and wrong. I think that's just obvious. Again, it's not as though I have some independent argument for that, just as I don't have an independent argument for thinking that suffering itself is bad. No, of course I don't have an argument for that. I can just see that it's obviously true. And similarly, I can just see that it's obviously true that some things are just intrinsically bad. They're bad in and of themselves, without reference to whether or not there's some being in the sky that has some attitude towards it, or whether there's some being in the sky whose nature says something about it. No, that doesn't matter. 
by my lights, that's utterly irrelevant. What matters, what makes the relevant action wrong is facts about the action, the victim, and so on, and facts about the suffering. It's facts intrinsic to the situation itself. So I think, again, this is the intrinsicality objection. This has nothing to do with their extrinsic relations to whether or not we ourselves think that it's bad, or whether or not God thinks that it's bad, or whether or not God commands something about the situation, or whether or not God's nature somehow specifies something about the situation. By my lights, that all seems quite patently irrelevant. So that's the first objection I would say. No, certain things are intrinsically good and intrinsically bad. There's something about Josh Rasmussen himself, which accounts for why he has dignity and value and so on. There's something about pursuing and cultivating the intellectual and moral virtues, honesty, integrity, curiosity, and so on. These things are by their very natures intrinsically good, intrinsically valuable. And so it's just patently false that they could only be valuable or good or have these various moral properties if God exists. No, what it is to be these sorts of things, it's intrinsically valuable. So that's one of my objections to these sorts of arguments. Another objection is a kind of second order euthyphro objection. So the first order problem basically poses the following question. Do God's commands make right actions right or wrong actions wrong? If yes, well then it would seem as though rightness and wrongness are arbitrary, right? right? Because then explanatorily prior to God's giving his commands, nothing is right or wrong. It's constituted by the command. It's dependent upon the command of whether or not it's right or wrong. So if God would have commanded us to torture innocents, that would have been right. But if not, if God's commands don't make right actions right or wrong actions wrong, well then it would seem as though divine command theory is false because then they're made right or wrong in virtue of other things. An alternative way to put this, which I think is more plausible, you could say God either has a reason for commanding what he does or he doesn't. If he does have a reason for commanding what he does, well, well, then it's surely that reason which is doing the explanatory heavy lifting with respect to accounting for the rightness or wrongness or goodness or badness of the thing in question. That reason is surely enough on its own to ground rightness or wrongness. But by contrast, if he doesn't have a reason, well, then it's completely arbitrary. He literally has no reason for commanding what he does, and it's literally arbitrary in that case. You might say, oh, no, God is essentially good. It's part of God's nature to be perfectly good and so on. So he couldn't, of course, command those other things and his commands flow from his nature. You could say those sorts of things. But then, of course, the second order euthyphro problem arises. Because then we can just ask, is there an explanation as to why God's essential nature, for example, lovingness, forbids rape? If so, if there is such an explanation as to why God's essential nature for forbids rape, well, then it seems that it's that explanation which is accounting for the rightness or wrongness or goodness or badness or permissibility or impermissibility of the thing in question. That explanation is surely enough on its own to ground morality. For example, if his nature forbids rape because rape is wrong in itself or violates the rights of the victim or causes unnecessary suffering to the victim, then it's those reasons that ground or explain the wrongness or the badness or whatever of the relevant action. So basically, there's either some more fundamental reason why God's essential nature specifies what it does, or there isn't. If there is some more fundamental reason, say because it violates rights, or say because of the badness of the suffering that the victim undergoes, or whatever, then we have a more fundamental explanation, and it's surely that which is doing the explanatory heavy lifting with respect to the badness or the rightness or the wrongness or whatever moral properties we're talking about. But by contrast, if there is no such more fundamental explanation, if there is no further more fundamental reason as to why God's nature forbids what it does or necessarily leads to commands which forbid what they do. Well, then again, we have this arbitrariness worry. Then there's no explanation as to why rape, for instance, is prohibited as opposed to morally obligatory and so on. So we get the arbitrariness problem that way. And so on the latter horn, we get the absurdity that, for instance, the prohibition on rape is arbitrary. But on the former horn, bringing in God seems to be entirely explanatorily odios. All you need is that more fundamental reason in order to account for or explain why the relevant action or state of affairs is good or bad or right or wrong or whatever, has the various moral or axiological or deontic properties that it does have. I, I actually do find that second order problem reasonably plausible. Still further objection that I would raise, so I think this is like the third objection. I think that there are perfectly adequate alternative explanations for why certain things are right or wrong or good or bad or whatever. I've already hinted at various such potential explanations. For instance, maybe there's something in the very nature of rape, or there's something in the nature of the victim's experience of it, or whatever, that accounts for why it's bad or wrong, or whatever. Or maybe we can give an explanation in terms of rights, or maybe we can give an explanation in terms of utility, or maybe we, there are so many different things that could provide groundings or explanations as to why certain actions or states of affairs have their axiological or deontic or moral properties. And so I think given that there are these alternative explanations, and given that none of these require that God exists, I think we have uh, excellent reason to think that this first premise is, at the very least, unmotivated.
So that's the third response. A fourth response that I would give is that it's what I call the both end in primitives objection. So the atheist, let's say, thinks that torturing someone is objectively wrong. Well, then you can ask why. And, you know, maybe they're going to cite certain facts about torture and facts about the victim and facts about suffering. Well, then you can say, oh, yeah, but why is suffering bad? You've kind of hit a primitive bedrock there because it is, right? Maybe that's either self-explanatory. Maybe it's not self-explanatory if we think that self-explanation is incoherent, but maybe this is just a primitive, but it's justifiably taken to be a primitive. Or maybe you think eudaimonia or flourishing or happiness or the flourishing of sentient beings or whatever is something that is just the primitive bedrock with respect to explaining why certain things are good. So yeah, you can play the why game with the atheist, but of course the atheist can turn around and similarly play the why game with the theist. What it metaphysically explains why torturing someone for fun is wrong. They might say certain rights or suffering is bad, but then you can ask why. Then they might say, oh, well, because God commands it to be that way or because God's nature is such that and then they give some story about God's nature. But again, you can still ask why. Why does God's nature give rise to that? Why does God's nature forbid rape? Why is God's nature such that it specifies that suffering is bad? Why is God's nature such that it specifies that human flourishing is good? You can ask these questions just as much of the theist. And they're eventually just going to have to say, lest they admit an infinitely descending regress of groundings, they're, they're also going to have to end in some kind of primitive bedrock. So both of us are ending in primitive bedrocks. We just fundamentally say, X grounds the badness or rightness or wrongness or goodness or badness of something, and that's that. End of story. You can try to ask, why does it ground the, the wrongness or badness or whatever? And again, we've just hit explanatory bedrock. And so it's not at all clear that the theist is in any better position than the non-theist with respect to grounding morality in this case. Both have a ground. It's just that their grounds are different. Both end in something that just primitively grounds, let's say, the badness of suffering, or that primitively grounds the goodness of the flourishing of sentient beings, or whatever. It's not at all clear why we should prefer a primitive ground, which is something like, God's nature is such as to specify that this is bad, or God's nature is such as to specify that this is good. It's not at all clear why that is a better primitive than the various primitives that I've been suggesting for the non-theist. And there's actually a really good article that makes a point that's quite similar to this, and it is called Could Morality Have a Source? by Chris Heathwood. It's published in the Journal of Ethics and Social Philosophy. So uh, what he... And he argues quite convincingly that ultimately every single meta-ethical theory is going to have some kind of primitive bedrock, that there's going to be some sort of moral truth or some sort of link between a grounding fact and the moral truth that it grounds. There's going to be some sort of fact like that has to be primitive on any theory whatsoever. So he says, it is a common idea that morality or moral truths, if there are any, must have some sort of source. If it is wrong to make a promise, or if our fundamental moral obligation is to maximize happiness, these facts must come from somewhere, perhaps from human nature, or from our agreements, or God. Such facts cannot be ungrounded, floating free. I not only deny this, I believe it's opposite. If we look more closely at the moral theories that are supposed to be paradigm examples of theories under which morality has a source, we will see that these theories, too, posit ungrounded moral truths. We are, anyway, here inquiring into the sort of explanation constituted by a kind of metaphysical grounding. And this metaphysical grounding, whatever else it is, is an asymmetric relation. If Q is true in virtue of P, P cannot also be true in virtue of Q. So the basic problem that he's pinpointing here is that we have this claim, right, which is DCT, divine command theory. And it's saying that an act is morally obligatory if and only if and because God commands it. Now we then ask, is God in some way or another the source of DCT itself, right? Because this is itself a kind of moral claim. It's making a claim about the conditions under which something is morally obligatory. So this is itself a moral claim. And so then we can ask, well, in virtue of what is this moral claim true? Well, if it's true in virtue of something about God, well then, again, we have just created another moral claim. Namely, the moral claim of DCT itself would then be true just in case and because of that more fundamental feature of God, which is explaining the moral truth of DCT. But again, that link between this more fundamental feature of God and DCT is itself a moral claim, right? Because DCT, as we've shown, is a moral claim, and so we are talking about the conditions under which a particular moral claim is true. In particular, we're asking what makes it true. That is itself a moral claim. And so then we can still further ask, what is the grounding of that moral claim? If you're going to posit a still more fundamental feature of God, well then, you could see where we're going. We're off on a vicious, infinite regress. So it seems as though we have to bottom out in some sort of primitive moral claim here. The only way to avoid a primitive moral truth then, that is a moral truth that isn't itself grounded in something more fundamental, the only way to avoid that is then to adopt something like self-grounding, where one and the same thing grounds itself. But that is, of course, absurd. Grounding is a priority relation. One thing is due to or owed to another, and it obtains in virtue of that other. And it's well nigh universally granted in philosophy that grounding relations are asymmetric. If one thing grounds another, then that further thing doesn't ground the first thing.
So everyone, it seems, is going to have to admit groundless moral facts. That is, moral facts that don't themselves have any further explanation or ground. And so it's no mark against a non-theistic theory that, oh, well, it can't ground all of morality. No, because neither can a theistic theory. So anyway, before I level my final objection, just a summary. So the first objection that I raised was an intrinsicality objection. I think it's obvious that some things intrinsically have the moral properties and values and so on that they do, and that has nothing to do with their extrinsic relations to God or God's commands or God's nature or whatever. The second problem was the higher order or the second order youth of her objection. The third problem was the alternative explanation objection. So for various moral facts and moral truths, I think there are perfectly adequate alternative explanations for why those things are true. That is why various actions are right or wrong or good or bad. And these alternative explanations don't adduce anything having to do with God. Now, of course, as I pointed out, these explanations are ultimately going to have to hit some explanatory bedrock, arguably. And the link between this bedrock, the fact that this bedrock grounds or explains certain moral truths, that fact is going to itself be some moral truth that doesn't have a further explanation. So I recognize that. But I pointed out firstly that there are going to be perfectly kosher, non-theistically acceptable principled stopping points, which are our primitive bedrocks. So either the fact that suffering is bad or the fact that something about suffering grounds its badness. And in the case of goodness, maybe it's just the fact that the flourishing of sentient creatures is good or something about the flourishing of sentient creatures is good. And then I then pointed out that in both cases, in both the theistic and non-theistic cases, you're going to end in some kind of primitive like this. Some kind of primitive which is reporting the link between your explanatory bedrock and the various moral properties that it is alleged to be explaining. And so theism isn't uniquely positioned to offer a grounding for morality. Both theism and non-theistic views have to have primitive moral truths. At the very least, primitive truths that link certain groundings and so that was my fourth response. There's no unique advantage accruing to theism because we're in the same boat, essentially. Both theistic and non-theistic meta-ethical views end in some kind of moral primitive. And then my fifth and final response to this specific line of reasoning is that this is, I think, going to be a specific problem for Christianity, because I would say that if you grant that morality is objective only if God exists, well, then that God is going to have to be a particular way. And I would argue that the particular way in which that God has to exist is definitely not the way that the Christian God is. And just to see that, you can look at the various Old Testament atrocities like commanding genocide, telling Abraham to kill his son, and of course, basically deceiving him in the process, leading Abraham to genuinely think that Abraham was going to kill his son, and so on. And of course, you have the various other sorts of atrocities like killing innocent children, and so on. Drowning innocent children, mind you. But anyway, let's watch some of this, which is a violent God question mark from the non-alchemist. Let's watch some of this to bring out this point further. The Bible is a violent book, but you already knew that. There's one story, however, that I don't think gets enough attention, and it's found in 2 Samuel chapter 21. The short version is that there's a famine in the land, and God tells David it's because Saul wronged the Gibeonites. To make things right, David has Saul's sons killed, and the famine stops. As everyone knows, killing people's kids to stop a famine makes total sense. Sarcasm aside, this really says what it appears to say. Even the conservative ESV study Bible pushes back against the idea that these seven were accomplices in Saul's acts. The text in no way suggests this. Furthermore, even Merib's oldest son could scarcely have been more than 10 when Saul died, because David must have been at least in his late teens when Merib married, and was no more than 30 when Saul died. It goes on to note that a more plausible suggestion is that God still exacted punishment from Saul's house for some of the evil that Saul had done. Yes, that's definitely a more plausible suggestion. And trying to wiggle out is pointless for two reasons. First, God accepted the totality of David's actions by relieving the famine, all without any kind of rebuke. And second, Yahweh killing the descendants of guilty parties is a well-established pattern in the biblical texts. Whether it's through massive flooding, destroying entire cities with fire, killing the Egyptian firstborn, punishing Korah's rebellion by swallowing up the household and goods of those involved, including their sons and little ones, into the earth, stoning and burning Achan and his sons, daughters, and livestock, since he took things for himself that were supposed to be destroyed, commanding the complete destruction of entire people groups, specifically to include the infants, or killing David's kid as a punishment for his own actions. Yahweh isn't afraid of indiscriminate killing, at least as he's depicted. And if you're a Christian watching this and want to defend Yahweh's honor, then by all means, give it your best shot in the comment section below. But I recommend that you just make peace with the fact that your God can get pretty bloodthirsty. So that gives you a glimpse into why I think that even if morality required, let's say, God's existence in some manner or another, arguably that wouldn't be the Christian God, and the Christian God is not a good candidate for that. Now, of course, you can say, yeah, well, God is the author of life. He could take away life if he wants. He can, you know, kill innocent people if he wants. He can command the genocide of people if he wants. He can kill innocent children 
He can drown innocent babies and livestock if he wants. He's God. Now, yes, yes, you could do that, but then don't expect me to take seriously your suggestion that this is the ultimate grounding of morality. This is the moral meter stick. Because then morality is very, 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 very different to how intuitively morality seems to be. In which case, we actually start to have an undercutting defeater for our second premise here. Because this second premise is resting on various obvious moral truths. Like, let's say, it's never okay to drown an innocent child. So you could try to say, oh yes, God himself doesn't have any moral duties, so he's not violating anything. Oh, God is the author of life, so he can take life if he wants it, and so on. You can say that, but then, again, you're just losing the plausibility that God is the ultimate standard of goodness and badness. You're losing the plausibility behind the claim, if it had any plausibility in the first place. <laughs> but you're losing the plausibility behind the claim that it's the very character of this being. It's the very nature of this being, which is the ultimate grounding of morality. No, not if the being acts in that sort of way. So... Uh, we can go to the an abductive version of this argument, which is just which that, more people should be aware of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, morality is objective. If morality is objective, then uh, God's the ex best explanation for it being objective. Uh, so God's the best explanation for it being objective. So probably God exists. There are a number of things to say here. I think premise two is false for many of the reasons I just articulated. I think it's just not at all clear that God is the best explanation for its being objective. Again, whatever feature you're pinpointing about God that grounds the objective moral values and truths and so on, whether it be God's commands or maybe his character or something about his nature, we can still ask, does God have some reason for commanding as he does? Or is there some more fundamental reason which explains why God's essential nature is as to forbid rape, or is as to essentially lead to a command that forbids rape? If there is such a more fundamental reason, well then there is actually arguably a better explanation for morality's being objective. Namely, in terms of that more fundamental reason and cutting out the middleman ontological commitment to this radically different kind of thing, God. We have a simpler and it seems more explanatorily illuminating explanation there. By contrast, if there is no such more fundamental reason, well then we have arbitrary objective moral values and truths, which of course is not at all a good explanation for objective moral values and truths if they're ultimately rendered entirely arbitrary. So no, I would reject that if morality is objective, then God is the best explanation. The best explanation is arguably in terms of certain intrinsic features of the various things in question, like suffering, or the flourishing conditions or the flourishing conditions for sentient creatures, which we might say are set by their intrinsic natures or characters. Or so God's the best explanation for being objective, so probably God exists. And you can support that by saying, look, morality always seems to be tied to persons. If morality is objective, that means it must be tied to a person whose nature is objective some way. So you can, there's different ways you can defend the main premise of that argument. Look, morality always seems to be tied to persons. Morality always seems to be tied to persons. That seems to me to be obviously false, and like pretty much self-evidently false. So consider a world in which there are no persons, and yet something like an elephant or a chimpanzee is, let's say, the quote-unquote highest form of life and sentience that there is. Suppose further that these beings can undergo various tragedies. Elephants can lose loved ones, and they exhibit signs of mourning over that. Elephants can undergo starvation, and it's quite obvious that they suffer through that. Now here, there are various moral values instantiated in this world. In particular, there's the badness of the suffering. There's the badness of the death of the loved one, and so on. So there are various moral truths in such a world, moral values, we might say, in such a world, and yet there are no persons in such a world. This, I think, is just an obvious counterexample to the claim that morality always seems to be tied to persons. So God's the best explanation for being objective, so probably God exists. And you can support that by saying, look, morality always seems to be tied to persons. If morality is objective, that means it must be tied to a person whose nature is objective some way. So you can What? <laughs> no. So, so again, firstly, no, morality is not always tied to persons. But secondly, even if it were always tied to persons, what that could lead us to say is like, no, it's actually in the very nature of the various persons to which it's tied to. You could say it's various facts about the very natures of those various persons to which morality is tied, right? It's in the very nature of personhood that the person has dignity and so on. That is a perfectly objective explanation for it. That doesn't require there to be some person in addition to the finite persons that there are, some sort of infinite person, which somehow grounds various moral truths and facts about persons. There are different ways you could defend the main premise of that argument. David Baggett's okay. a good person to look at for that one. Yes. We have uh, arguments from evil for the existence of God. We have the first one, the normative implications of evil. Evil contrastively implies that there is a way the world ought to be. Uh, some actually come close to defining evil this way as a deviation or distortion or corruption of the way things are supposed to be. But if that's true, then there's a way the world uh, ought to be. Uh, but there can be a way the world ought to be only if there's an intention or goal or purpose behind it. Uh, so there is an intention or, or goal or purpose behind the world. Uh, the, if that's true, then that can be true only if God exists, so God exists. So, 
I think premise two is false, or at least unmotivated. I can say God either has some reason behind his intention or he doesn't. So God is intending the world to be such that humans don't languish for the entirety of their lives. Why? Right? Is there some underlying reason behind God's intention? There either is or there isn't. If there is an underlying reason, well, then it's surely that reason which is doing the explanatory heavy lifting with respect to accounting for the wrongness or badness or impermissibility of the thing in question, of the badness, let's say, of a world in which humans are languishing for the entirety of their lives. But if God doesn't have a reason behind his intention, well, then again, we are thrust into arbitrariness. Moreover, there's the point about alternative explanations. There are perfectly fine alternative explanations as to why the world ought to be certain ways rather than others that don't make any reference to intentions or goals or designs. I've already been articulating various ones. And of course, there's the both end in primitives problem that I was mentioning earlier. And premise four, I think here is also probably false. So for instance, maybe the motivation or goal or design or purpose comes from a morally indifferent creator. The creator could still be, the creator could still have various intentions. It could easily be the case that there is an intention or goal or design or purpose behind the world. And yet the thing with that intention or goal or design or purpose isn't God. It could be some Zeus-like character. It could be some morally indifferent creator. It could be an aesthetic deism hypothesis, a la Paul Draper. It could be boatloads of things. It doesn't have to be God. Evil is privation. Evil is a privation of goodness. It's like, well, the, the common analogy is it's like light and darkness. Evil is not primary. It doesn't have like some positive ontological status. Rather, it's uh, a deviation or corruption or something to that effect of what is good. So evil is privation. If evil is a privation of goodness. One thing that we should say here is that premise one is deeply questionable and it's rejected by most ethicists, meta-ethicists, and metaphysicians. It has difficulties involving pain, false belief, and so on. So, for instance, there seems to be a kind of positive phenomenological character associated with pain, and that itself seems to be bad. There doesn't seem to be, a, like, a privation of goodness there. Like, oh, it's the absence of, what, a pleasurable state of mind? No, it's not merely the absence of a pleasurable state of mind. It doesn't seem to be an absence of, of anything. There seems to be a kind of positive, qualitative feel there. There are certain qualia associated with pain, and those themselves seem to be bad, and it seems to have a kind of positively bad character there. Now, of course, people who defend evil as privation are aware of these sorts of objections. You can go back and forth and back and forth on objections, reposts, objections, reposts, and so on. Now, I just want to make you guys aware of a very good lecture that Alexander Proust has made on the privation theory of evil. He gives various quite serious objections to it, and then he goes on to develop his own theory of evil as a misarrangement. But he does criticize this traditional privation theory of evil, and he goes through pain, false belief, sin, and various other problems that are quite serious problems for the theory. And this is by CLE for Science 2021, New Perspectives in Phil of Religion, 13 July, number two. So check that out if you are interested in looking at the privation theory of evil further. This goodness is ontologically an explicit status. Rather, it's uh, a deviation or corruption or something to that effect of what is good. So evil is privation. If evil is a privation of goodness, goodness is ontologically and explanatorily prior to evil. If goodness is ontologically and explanatorily prior to evil, then there's more goodness in the world than evil. As being the main premise, if there's more goodness in the world than evil, probably God exists, so probably God exists. Now, the clever thing here is that four is just the converse of the problem of evil. The skeptics would argue that uh, if there's more evil in the world than good, then probably God does not exist. Well, this just flips this around and says there's probably more goodness in the world than evil if evil is understood as privation. Let's look at premise three because that seems like a blatant non sequitur to me. If goodness is ontologically and explanatorily prior to evil, there is more goodness in the world than evil. What? Uh, from the fact that things of type 1 depend on things of type 2, such that type 2 is ontologically and explanatorily prior to type 1, it obviously doesn't follow that there are more things of type 2 than type 1. If the type God is explanatorily and ontologically prior to the type created things, then there are more gods than there are created things. No, that's just absurd. God is ontologically and explanatorily prior to created things. Does it follow that there are more gods, or that there's somehow more of God? than there are created things. No, there are boatloads of created things and there's only one God. Fundamentality does not imply a greater prevalence of the fundamental thing. If anything, when you get more and more fundamental, you get more and more unified, you get more and more sparse, you get fewer and fewer things. We could actually say if goodness is ontologically and explanatorily prior to evil, then there's more evil in the world than good. Because again, as you go through the more fundamental layers of reality, you tend to get fewer and fewer entities. You tend to get fewer and fewer kinds of entities. You tend to get more and more unified, and so on. You see that in science. The more fundamental you go, the more and more unified you get. You get this very simple and elegant 
standard model of particle physics, which explains the vast array and diversity of things. So as you go more fundamental, as you go to ontologically and explanatorily prior things, there are fewer of those. So if goodness is ontologically and explanatorily prior to evil, there is more evil in the world than there is good. And of course, given what Chad had just said, if there's more evil than good, then probably God doesn't exist. So probably God doesn't exist. We seem to have an even more powerful argument from evil as the privation of the good against God's existence here. Horrendous evils. Some evils are so bad that they seem to have a non-naturalistic dimension to them. I mean, some evils are just so objectively appalling and horrendous that they seem to have cosmic or spiritual significance. They seem satanic almost or, or to require hell. It, they provoke existential outrage, uh, shaking one's fist at heaven, that sort of thing. Reading up on this particular argument, some of the examples of horrendous evils I encountered were just so, oh, I mean, I, I, I won't be able to get them out of my mind for a long time. So if one, then we're justified in thinking that Maybe Chad has the seeming that somehow they require some sort of supernaturalistic dimension to them or something like that. I don't have that seeming at all. We know from psychology how horrendous humans can get on their own. We know that humans are susceptible to propaganda. We can dehumanize others. You can come to see all other humans as literal vermin. And once you do that, you can kind of turn off your empathy for them in some sense, and you can do really atrocious things. And we know the various natural mechanisms by which this happens. That's what a lot of social psychology is literally dedicated to. So anyway, I don't find this first premise at all plausible. No, that's just people doing these sorts of things. People can be really, really, really depraved and bad. They do have a non-naturalistic dimension to them. The best explanation of there being evil so horrendous that they have a non-naturalistic dimension is that good and evil have a deep spiritual significance. So... Two here, it's not clear that that is true. If, number one, then we are justified in thinking that they do have a non-naturalistic dimension to them. Firstly, we have to take into account that that's a very non-simple explanation. I mean, given the success of science in finding naturalistic explanations for the various actions that humans have done throughout the past, we should expect, arguably, that the very, very, very horrendous things that humans, that humans do that might seem to have a non-naturalistic dimension to them are likewise susceptible to a naturalistic explanation. That's a kind of argument from the success of historical naturalistic social psychology. So that would seem to be a defeater for the inference from the seeming to the truth of the seeming. Moreover, there are alternative explanations that don't involve a non-naturalistic dimension to them, as I've just been specifying. So... So probably good and evil do have a deep spiritual significance. But if that's true, then something like theism is probably true. So something like theism is probably true. I should also say with respect to two, appealing to some sort of supernaturalistic dimension to these sorts of evils, it seems to increase complexity. It seems to be predictively fruitless. Like, why do you expect it in some cases and not in others? Why do you see it in 1940s Germany rather than, let's say, 2022 West Lafayette, Indiana, and so on. Well, actually, we do have certain explanations. We can look at the socio and historical and psychological factors that went into the Weimar Republic and so on, and the, the cultural history of Germany and so on. So we have these various naturalistic explanations. That is what is predictively fruitful. What's predictably fruitless is that there are, like, what, demons running around somehow? And they really like to correspond to the, the cultural and sociological changes and psychological changes, and they just happen to do it so that it really nicely tracks onto these naturalistic explanations. It's a, just a predictive fruitless cosmic coincidence that that kind of happens. And it also doesn't seem to fit nicely with our background knowledge of various causes of these sorts of phenomena. I would also say that premise five is deeply questionable. There are lots of non-theistic supernaturalistic views. For example, maybe there are just demons and angels lurking around. There's no need for God here, absent some further considerations or arguments. If they have deep spiritual significance, all that would follow is that there's some, like, spiritual realm, and that certain things in the spiritual realm are somehow influencing the horrendousness of various evils or influencing stuff that happens in the world. Why would that require God to exist? Why would that even probabilify theism? There are boatloads of other supernaturalistic explanations available for that. Oh, I, I didn't know that that was... So is this... A, they're planning it from that? Well, it's in his two dozen or so paper, and every every argument in that paper is just defended ever so briefly. But yeah, that's, that's part right. of his argument. Okay, interesting. All right, let's move on. So from universal beliefs, certain moral beliefs are shared by all of humanity. If that's true, then God's the best explanation for that. So God's the best explanation for there being beliefs shared by, moral beliefs shared by all of humanity, so probably God exists. So it's not entirely clear that premise one is true. I'd like to see the empirical research for it. That is an empirical claim. I know there has been some research done on certain values that you can find across humanity, but it's unclear how you demarcate values and beliefs and the interplay between them anyway. Uh, and they get manifested differently, of course, in different cultural contexts. I'm not saying that this premise is false, clearly, but I'd like to see the empirical research behind it. Um, 
And there also, moreover, with respect to premise two, there seem to be simpler explanations in terms of, say, our having reliable moral beliefs, tracking moral reality, uh, or perhaps in terms of our evolutionary history. You might, of course, claim that God best explains these further facts, but then that would be a separate argument and the onus is on you to prove that claim. And plus, I don't know, why would theism predict this data? Disagreement, we often hear from theists themselves, provides opportunity for growth and flourishing and intercommunity dialogue and intercultural dialogue and growing and learning and so on. So why wouldn't we actually expect God to actualize a world in which there is profound moral disagreement such that no moral beliefs are universally shared by all of humanity? That would facilitate various goods. We can dialogue with each other. We can try to convince one another of accepting certain moral beliefs that we think are true and are better than the moral beliefs that other people have. We can have dialogue across ideological barriers. Moreover, God could easily have some morally sufficient reason for allowing this kind of moral doxastic discord, you know, skeptical theism and all. So I guess my point is just that why would theism lead us to expect that there are certain moral beliefs shared by all of humanity? Or at least why would it lead us to expect it more than a relevant naturalistic alternative hypothesis, or at least even a relevant non-theistic alternative hypothesis. Again, you can say something like, oh, it's good that we all agree on certain moral beliefs and so on, but yeah, it's also good that we have disagreements. Again, as I pointed out, disagreement provides opportunities for growth and flourishing and inter-community, inter intercultural dialogue and dialogue across ideological barriers and coming to know certain truths and building relationships and bridges between different people groups with differing fundamental beliefs and so on. So again, where's the predictive payoff of theism here? The main move here is just that, look, there can be dis moral disagreements uh, between cultures and so forth, but uh, actually, these di dis disagreements uh, turn out to be fairly superficial. The classic example is uh, love your neighbors yourself seems to be a pretty universally agreed upon moral principle. It just turns out that one tribe in Africa that sees it okay to murder members of another tribe, they just don't see members of the other tribe as persons. <laughs> so they agree with the underlying principle. There's just unclarity on how it applies. So there's your argument from universal moral beliefs. Okay, Sidgwick and Kant. Sidgwick, uh, a moral philosopher in the early 20th century, he thought that the central problem of ethics was showing how one could be true. Acting morally is always rational, only if it's always uh, what's best, ultimately what's best for me. Uh, and he said it must be rational for me to act morally. Otherwise, noble deeds like self-sacrifice and altruism might be irrational. But it seems true that that's never irrational uh, to be altruistic. Uh, so, two, acting morally is always what's ultimately what's best for me, only if God exists. Two is equivalent to if God does not exist, then acting morally is not always what's ultimately best for me. Uh, that seems true. I mean, morality and self-interest come apart if God does not exist. Uh, so three, acting morally is always rational only if God exists. Acting morally is always rational, so God exists. So I think there are several problems with this. So premise one seems false to me. Consider an analog. So again, premise one says acting morally is always rational only if it's always what's ultimately best for me. Consider. Being epistemically responsible is always rational only if it's always what's best for me. No! Sometimes we have to believe the truth, even if the truth bloody sucks for me. Similarly, it's not at all implausible to suppose that sometimes we have to behave in a certain way, even if behaving that way bloody sucks for me. I mean, even if I have to make certain sacrifices, and I don't want to, it'll make me sad, and so on, morality still has that demand of me. Similarly, rationality has certain demands of me. Even if I don't want to believe that I have some, let's say, interminable illness, and my life would be better if I didn't have that belief and I could just ignore it and I could live in a kind of delusion where I think everything is all fine and dandy. Still, it's epistemically responsible for me. It is rational for me. And I ought to still believe what is true in that case, even though it's not what's best for me. And so in the case of at least epistemology, it's false that it's always rational for you to believe what's true only if it's always ultimately what's best for you to believe what's true. And similarly, I would say acting morally can be rational even if it's not ultimately what's best for you. It also seems to me that premise two here is false. There could be lots of other ways that acting morally could always be what's ultimately best for me without God existing. For example, maybe there's some sort of karma kind of thing going on, or maybe there's some strange law of nature or whatever. Sure, those have a low prior probability, but so does a God who ensures that every morally action corresponds to what's ultimately best for me. That's also a pretty metaphysically profligate hypothesis. My point here is just that this is just false. There are other ways for acting morally to always be what's best for me, other than involving God's existence. And finally, it's actually not clear to me whether premise four is true, and indeed it seems quite contestable. Consider two actions that I might perform. One of them is the moral action A, and then the other one is some other act A star, which is based on prudential or practical considerations, rather than specifically moral considerations. Now, doing the moral action over the action based on prudential or practical considerations might actually in some cases be irrational. So there might be a case where you have two choices, choice one and choice two. Choice one only involves doing something like super duper slightly wrong. Like maybe it's just lying about the millionth digit of pi, or maybe it's just like slightly flicking the ear of your cousin, which you know will cause like 
a millisecond of ever so slight pain and annoyance to them or whatever. In that case, choice one, w we can suppose, would be the morally wrong thing to do versus choice two, which is refrain from doing that. But suppose that that morally wrong thing to do is attached to various prudential and practical considerations, benefits indeed, that far outweigh by like quadrillions to one the badness of whatever you're doing. In this case, it's not actually clear that doing the moral action is the rational thing to do. It might be the case that because it's only ever so slightly immoral, and because whatever you're doing is ever so slightly immoral, together with the extremely beneficial practical or prudential considerations that come along with it, Perhaps it's actually rational to do that one and irrational to go with the more moral option. Anyway, it's just not clear to me whether or not that is true. Of course, you might try to collapse the prudential and practical considerations and say that those, after all, count as moral reasons. That's questionable. My point here is just to establish sufficient unclarity as to whether or not number four is true. Because, again, I can concoct these sorts of scenarios where it's only this super duper minorly wrong thing, but it's accompanied by, if you do it, super duper beneficial, prudential, or practical consequences or considerations. And that by my lights shows that it's at least unclear whether or not premise four here is true. And that's all that I need to do in criticizing the argument. I just need to show that it's not at all clear whether one of the premises is true. We have another Kantian argument yeah, from, from Robert Adams. Uh, central term here uh, is what it means to be for a belief to be demoralizing. And he just says it's it means it's weakening or deterioration of moral motivation. So if a belief is demoralizing, it's morally undesirable. Uh, if a belief is morally undesirable, there is a moral advantage in believing the opposite. It is demoralizing to believe that there is no moral order in the universe. And by moral order, he just means there is a balance of good over evil in the universe where our moral acts make significant difference to that balance. Uh, so it's demoralizing to believe that there's no moral order in the universe, that nothing we do morally can make a difference. So it's morally undesirable to believe that there's no moral order in the universe. Uh, there's moral advantage in believing that there is a moral order in the universe. Theism provides the most adequate theory of a moral order of the universe. If theism provides the most adequate theory of a moral order of the universe, there's moral advantage in accepting theism, so there's moral advantage in... Sorry, I, I had the slide up late here, so... That's all right. Uh, if you wanna, if you wanna that one in, had a lot of premises. So, let's go back. So, I think premise one is at least questionable. This is equivalent to saying that if a belief is morally desirable, then it isn't demoralizing. But, I don't know, there seem to be plenty of beliefs that could be both morally desirable and demoralizing. For some people who are rich, I don't know, maybe they think, yes, uh, ultimately it's morally desirable that we have redistributive justice so that other people can not starve when they are bathing in their mansion and so on. Uh, so they might think, yeah, okay, that's morally desirable, but it still might be demoralizing to them in some sense. Maybe they just really want to hold on to their riches. Maybe they want to have their bath swords. Oh, yes. But anyway, you can kind of see how different beliefs that might be morally desirable could be demoralizing against the backdrop of a different preference structure, which in some sense is in discord or in disharmony with the moral facts. Similarly, lots of people who might experience attraction to people of the same sex. They, in Christianity, might find certain Christian doctrines, like, for instance, that engaging in homosexual activity is strongly immoral, they might find those deeply demoralizing, and yet they might, because they're Christians, they might find them morally desirable. So, yeah, in some sense, it's what we should desire given what's morally true. So in that sense, it's morally desirable. That's what's the moral thing to do, but it still might be demoralizing to them. They might not be able to, let's say, marry the person that they love. That can be tr profoundly demoralizing. Similarly with other traditional Christian moral ethical doctrines with respect to things like transgenderism and other sorts of things. So anyway, premise one is equivalent to, again, saying that if a belief is morally desirable, then it isn't demoralizing. But as I've pointed out, there seem to be morally desirable beliefs that actually may very well be demoralizing for at least some people. So that's premise one. What about premise three? This premise seems implausible by my lights. Maybe it's demoralizing for some people to think that there is no moral order in the universe, but for others, it could be profoundly galvanizing. It could spur you to help make the world better. It's precisely because there isn't some overarching pattern of moral order, say, a pattern in which good always wins or a pattern in which justice is always enacted, that we can be motivated to rectify things, to push for reform, to change things for the better. So again, although this might be demoralizing for some people, it could be galvanizing for lots of others. So it's not just true simpliciter that it is demoralizing to believe that there is no moral order in the universe. It's also not clear that premise six is true. Premise six says that theism is the best explanation of there being moral order in the universe. Again, though, there are lots of alternative explanations of this. 
maybe there's some sort of thing like karma. Maybe there is some sort of strange natural law that makes it such that goodness prevails over evil or something like that. My point here is just it's at least not clear which of these is the best explanation of there being moral order in the universe. Again, you might think that karma or a law of nature has a really low prior probability, but the same thing could equally be said about God trying to actualize a moral order. I'm not positively claiming that these alternative explanations are more probable than theism. I'm just saying it's not clear which of these explanations, qua an explanation of there being moral order, it's not clear which one of these is the best explanation. Premise 7 also seems to be a non sequitur here. Even if there's a moral advantage accruing to theism with respect to moral order, that doesn't at all entail that accepting theism is morally advantageous all things considered. There could easily be lots of other respects in which theism is not morally advantageous. For example, in the case of Christianity, eternal conscious torment, Old Testament atrocities, and so on. And I also reject premise 8. That just seems quite clearly false to me. If there's moral advantage in accepting a position, you should accept that position. Like, what? <laughs> there seems to be moral advantage in accepting the position of there being some sort of karmic laws. After all, that gives literally everyone exactly what they are due. So there definitely seems to be some sort of moral advantage in accepting karma. But does that mean you should accept that there is this thing called karma? No, of course it doesn't mean that. So premise 8 just seems to me to be clearly false. But anyway, let's continue. Uh, and that one is in Robert Adams' moral arguments for theistic belief. Pretty cool. Yeah. Oderberg's argument from cosmic justice. And by mm -hmm. cosmic justice, he means um, all virtue is rewarded and all vice is punished. Okay. So premise 1, we live in a rational moral order. Uh, and by rational moral order, uh, we mean it's, it's the case that... Uh, where it always makes rational sense to behave morally. That's what it means that we live in a rational moral order. It makes sense to, always makes sense to, to behave morally. If we Real live quick. in a rational moral order, yeah. Liz, Liz Jackson just chimed in in the live chat. She said, Chad isn't doing push-ups? Lame. <laughs> oh, man. There, were a time, there was a time in high school. By the way, Liz Jackson is a queen. When I was, I was the king of push-up contests, believe it or not. I was a wrestler in high school. I prided myself on that. <laughs> My wife would appreciate it if I did more push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> so we live in a rational moral order. Uh, if we live in a rational moral order, there's cosmic justice. Again, that's understood as being all virtue is rewarded, all vice is, is punished. So there's cosmic justice. If there's cosmic justice, there must be a cosmic judge who administers it. So there's a cosmic judge who administers it. Okay, so... Let's listen to how we defined rational moral order again and cosmic justice again, because depending on those definitions, it's going to affect which premise I think is plausible or most plausibly rejected. Oderberg's argument from cosmic justice, and by okay. cosmic justice he means um, all virtue is rewarded and all vice is punished. One thing that we should note here is that even under Christian theism, there doesn't seem to be cosmic justice in that sense. If someone lives an atrocious life, but on their deathbed they repent, they accept Jesus, they do whatever is required to get into heaven or whatever, well then, there was lots of vices during their life that they're, that's not going to go punished, unless you think they're going to go to hell first and then go to heaven, or unless you think that they're going to go to purgatory first and then go to heaven. But if we're assuming that they really are genuinely sorry, and if you're a Catholic, maybe they went to confession and they confessed it all, and moreover then received the Eucharist, and so on. In that case, they would be free of both mortal and venial sin, and in that case, they would go straight to heaven, assuming that they were, really were contrite, and assuming, of course, that they did their penance. In that case, the vice isn't, after all, punished. The vice that this person lived for the first, let's say, 80 years of their life isn't punished, after all various prominent versions of Christianity are going to be incompatible with this argument, arguably. But let's set that aside. Let's listen to how we define these things. So cosmic justice is every virtue is rewarded and every vice is punished. So premise one, we live in a rational moral order. Uh, and by rational moral order, uh, we mean it's, it's the case that uh, where it always makes rational sense to behave morally. That's what it means that we live. Okay, so if it always makes sense to behave rationally, then virtue is always rewarded and vice is always punished. To me, that just seems like a straightforward non sequitur. It could easily be the case that it makes sense to live morally, to do what you're obliged to do, given the demands of morality, to cultivate virtue and so on, even if you're not ultimately rewarded for your virtue or punished for your vice. Seriously, does it only make sense to live a moral life if there's a carrot and a stick? This way of thinking is just so deeply implausible. No, do good for goodness sake, because it's intrinsically valuable. And that makes perfect sense even if absolutely every one of your virtuous deeds isn't ultimately rewarded. And even if some of others' vicious deeds aren't ultimately punished. So this just strikes me as deeply, deeply implausible. But even setting that aside, at premise 4, it's just not at all clear whether that's true. Again, there are alternative ways that you could have cosmic justice without there being a cosmic judge who administers it. Again, you could have something like karma, you could have some strange law of nature, or whatever.
Premise 5, further still, is very far from theism. The cosmic judge could be something like a Zeus-like character, it could be an aesthetic deist hypothesis, it could be any among an infinite array of non-theistic but quasi-supernaturalistic cosmic judges. But again, to have a fully informed view on the matter, I'd have to read Oderberg's paper or book chapter, but uh, I said that I was going to basically make this video without doing additional research in the sense of research beyond what I've already done throughout my years of studying philosophy of religion. So anyway, let's continue inspired a lot of similar arguments. Uh, one, in every actual case, one has most reason to do what is morally required. So one just says that there is overriding reason to perform one's moral duty. If there is no God and no afterlife. Well, I guess I do want to say on premise one, again, given what I said earlier, it's at least not 100% clear to me that premise one is true. It seems that I can at least conceive of a case where, again, you have two different choices. Under one of the choices, you're doing something that is ever so slightly morally bad, and so you ought not do it in the moral sense of ought, and yet there are tremendous practical and prudential benefits from doing it. And then on the other one, you don't secure those practical and prudential benefits, but you still avoid doing the ever so slightly immoral thing. And things get complicated here because someone might say that those practical and prudential considerations themselves might turn into moral reasons, and so actually on the whole, it's false that you ought not do that first option, but then we get into the weeds about what's the nature of moral reasons, how do they relate to practical and prudential reasons, and so on. So that just further supports my claim that it's just not clear whether premise one is true because you get into all these different weeds about these debates about the nature of reasons, about the nature of practical and prudential reasons, as well as how they relate to moral reasons, and so on. If there is no God and no afterlife, uh, then there are cases where morality requires that one make great sacrifice for only modest benefits. And he gives the example of like a poor widow who has the opportunity to steal like $10 million, and she knows that she would never get caught, and no one else would be harmed by this. This is $10 million that no one ever even realized existed, uh, but she would be stealing it if she took it. So if there's no God and no afterlife, then there are cases where morality requires that one make a great sacrifice for only modest benefits. So if there's no God, uh, there's no reason why she shouldn't take that $10 million. Um, so uh, if a given case, if, if in a given case, morality requires that one make a great sacrifice only f for only modest benefits, then one does not have the most reason to do what is morally required. I've already given some reasons for thinking that it's not clear whether premise one is true, but suppose that I granted premise one, then I think premise three is very probably false. Again, this almost sounds like carrot and stick reasoning. It doesn't matter whether morality is requiring you to make great personal sacrifice for only modest benefits, you're still always going to have most reason to do what is morally required. Again, if one always has most reason to do what's morally required, this seems to be something about the very nature of morality or the very nature of moral obligation, that it's, by nature, it's overriding. And in that case, it doesn't matter if there are going to be great personal sacrifices for only modest benefits to you, because the very nature of morality is to be overriding, in which case this premise three is going to be false. No, it is false that if there are cases where morality requires one to make great personal sacrifice for only modest benefits, then you don't always have most reason to do what's morally required. No, regardless of whether or not there are cases of morality, you still have most reason to do what is morally required. Again, that's probably because there's something in the very nature of moral obligation which makes it overriding of every other consideration. Granting premise one, I think premise three is extremely implausible. Well, if there is no God or afterlife, then in some cases one does not have the most reason to do what is morally required. But she does have a uh, reason to do what's morally required, namely not steal a $10 million. So it's false that there is no God or afterlife. There you go, layman's moral argument. Another thing I want to say here is that premise two strikes me as deeply implausible. This is equivalent to saying that if there are no cases where morality requires one to make great personal sacrifice for only modest benefits, then either God exists or an afterlife exists or both. For starters, that doesn't get you even God's existence. If you're saying it's false that there is no God or afterlife, one way for this to be false is for it there actually to be no God, but for there to be an afterlife. So interestingly, we don't even have an argument for God's existence. Now, a necessary condition for there being no cases where morality requires one to make great personal sacrifice for only modest benefits probably is there being an afterlife, but it's certainly not there being a god. You can have a whole concoction of non-theistic views that nevertheless accommodate an afterlife and that prevent there being cases where morality requires one to make these super huge personal sacrifices for only modest benefits. Karma, for instance, is one such hypothesis. In that case, if you're doing something that's like super morally valuable, you're not making a great personal sacrifice for only modest benefits because the, the benefits aren't actually, after all, that modest. You are going to be rewarded given the karmic cycle or whatever. Or there could be some strange law of nature or whatever. So anyway, I don't find this argument plausible. So let's move on. There you go, Lenin's moral argument. Okay, we have an interesting set of arguments that push more toward a Christian conception of God and not just a theistic conception. So we have Linda Zagzebski's argument uh, from the need for divine aid and being moral. Now she asks, you know, classic question that you encounter in ethics classes, why be moral? Well, she says, uh, why try to be moral? 
And so by thinking about this question, uh, she has the following argument. It is rational to try to be moral only if it's rational to believe the attempt would likely be successful. Well, let's stop at that first premise because I find it deeply questionable. So to find a counterexample to this, we only need to cook up a case in which it's rational to try to be moral, and yet it is not rational to believe that the attempt would likely be successful. Well, by my lights, here's one such case. Suppose you know there's only a 50% chance that your attempt to be moral will be successful. Perhaps we discover something about human nature that delivers this result, or perhaps you have some sort of condition, whether genetic or psychological or spiritual, that disposes you toward immorality, and that there's only a 50% chance that you can overcome this disposition and be moral. Okay, so again, suppose you know that there's only a 50% chance that your attempt to be moral will be successful. But suppose you also know that if God exists, trying your utmost to be moral despite this disposition makes it likely that you will inherit eternal life in heaven with God, whereas not trying to be moral makes it unlikely that you will inherit eternal life. And if God doesn't exist, you will only have the finite costs and benefits associated with trying or not trying. In that case, we can construct a decision matrix and show that it's rational to try to be moral in this case, so long as you don't assign God's existence a probability of zero. So, supposing you don't have such a credence, we've thereby constructed a scenario in which one, it's rational to try to be moral, and yet two, it is not rational to believe that the attempt would likely be successful. So anyway, that kind of decision matrix response seems to give a counterexample to premise one. So let's continue though. To try to be moral only if it's rational to believe the attempt would likely be successful. But it's not rational to believe the attempt would likely be successful if all we have is our own human faculties to go on. And this is because if all we have is our own faculties, uh, we can't be confident that we have genuine moral knowledge, given the depth and diversity of moral disagreements. (laughs) Given the depth and diversity of moral disagreements, we can't be confident that we have moral knowledge if all we have is our human faculties to go on. That seems deeply implausible. Firstly, Even if we had divine faculties to go on, there is still this depth and degree and extent of moral disagreement. So how does adding something beyond our own human faculties, how does that even help? How does that help you have genuine moral knowledge in light of the depth and degree and extent of moral disagreement that we find? If we have something that calls into question your having moral knowledge at all in this case, which is questionable, but if we even have something that calls into question whether or not you have moral knowledge in this case, it's surely the very fact of widespread, deep, fundamental, moral disagreement. Even if you think you have some sort of divine revelation that helps you, the fact of disagreement just re-arises because lots of these other people who disagree with you morally think they have divine revelation on their side. Moreover, even the people who share your own divine revelation will probably have differing moral views than you perhaps because they interpret the divine revelation differently, or whatever. For instance, within Christian circles, very deep and profound and significant moral disagreement about, for instance, homosexuality, about transgenderism, about infant baptism, about the way Christianity should relate to the state, and so on. So that seems really implausible. If you're appealing to the depth and extent and and widespread aspects of moral disagreement, to say that you don't have moral knowledge in the case that you only have your own human faculties to go on, Well, then you're also not going to have moral knowledge in the case where you have more than your own human faculties to go on, because the same disagreement is going to be present there. So anyway, uh, let's go back. Uh, We can't be confident that uh, we can overcome our moral weaknesses and bring about good in the world, uh, and we can't be confident that our moral efforts wouldn't just be vain in the end. Um, Why, though? We have moral exemplar humans. We do know that humans are capable of being moral and overcoming lots of their weaknesses and so on, because we've actually seen it. So premise two just seems to be false by my lights. Humans are perfectly capable of being moral and indeed likely to become moral on their own so long as they commit themselves to it, or so the non-theist will say again. And so it's perfectly rational to think one's attempt would be successful even if we have our own human faculties to rely on. After all, by the naturalist lights, there have been some profoundly virtuous human beings, and they became virtuous without requiring anything other than their own human faculties to go on. And if one wants to convince the naturalist to think that they have more than their own human faculties to go on, they need to be given some non-question-begging reason in support of that. But three, it is rational to try to be moral, so it's rational to believe the attempt would likely be successful, so we have more than just our own human faculties to go on follows logically from two and four. Now, if a theory postulates exactly what more we need to be rational in believing the attempt at being moral would be likely be successful, then that then it's rational to believe that theory. Christian theism postulates exactly what more we need to be rational in believing the attempt at being moral would likely be successful. Namely, uh, we have, uh, by divine revelation, uh, divine assurance of and guidance, grace, providence, uh, exactly we need, the assurance of genuine moral knowledge, the assurance that we can overcome moral weakness, uh, and that our moral efforts wouldn't be in vain. And so it's rational to believe Christian theism. <laughs>
There's a lot to say here. Premise six, by my light, seems clearly false. Um, if a theory postulates exactly what more we need to be rational, believing the attempt at being moral would likely be successful, then it's rational to believe that theory. No, even if this antecedent being true, even if that counts in favor of a theory, there could easily be defeaters and countervailing considerations, such that those make it, no, not rational after all, to believe that theory. So even if this counts in favor of a theory, which is questionable, but even if it does count in favor of a theory, it doesn't automatically follow that it's rational to believe the theory. Again, you have to look at your total evidence. And moreover, there could be defeaters and countervailing considerations. Moreover, think about Judaism and Islam and bare non-religious theism and so on. These sorts of views also postulate what more we need to be rational in believing the attempt at being moral would likely be successful. Treating Islam as a theory here, it's not as though under the theory of Islam, Allah is somehow impotent to make people who attempt at being moral likely be successful. No, Allah can easily do that, and Allah does do that. Same with Judaism and Yahweh, and same with bare non-religious theism as well. You have an omnipotent God in the picture who can provide you with the requisite divine assistance, and so on. So there are boatloads of other theories apart from Christianity that also postulate what more we need to be rational in believing the attempt at being moral would likely be successful. Would it, does it follow that it's rational to believe absolutely every single one of these? Well, then it would follow that it's rational to believe incompatible things. So anyway, I think that this just provides us with a counterexample to six. No, it doesn't follow that it's rational to believe a given theory just because it postulates exactly what more we need to be rational in believing the attempt at being moral would likely be successful. Islam does this, Judaism does this, bare non-religious theism does this, and lots of other hypotheses do this as well. Let's move on because I've already argued that there are so many different places where this argument is exceedingly weak and arguably clearly false, but let's continue. John Hare, the moral, the moral gap. gap. Yeah. Uh, he's defended this argument over the course of like three decades. Now, what he means by the moral gap is it's a gap between the demand that morality places on us and our natural capacity to live up to it. So uh, morality essentially demands that we be perfect. <laughs> uh, but it seems like we can't be perfect. So if, again, if you ought to do X, you can do X. And then it's false that we ought to be perfect because as he just said, no, we can't be perfect. So then it's just false that we ought to be perfect, given this principle that if one ought to do X, then one can do X, that ought presupposes or ought implies can. Of course, you might say, oh, well, you can secure that if you have God in the picture, but no naturalist, no atheist would ever grant that we ought to be perfect because they don't have God in the picture. And so to simply assert that we ought to be perfect is simply to beg the question against the naturalist or the atheist. They would never grant that, assuming, of course, they accept that ought implies can, as this argument requires. So assuming that they grant that ought implies can, then no naturalist or atheist would ever grant. They would never grant that one ought to be perfect, because no, of course we can't be perfect. Only if you antecedently are justified in accepting theism would you be justified in accepting that we ought to be perfect. In which case, the argument would be utterly dialectically toothless. But anyway, the principle that ought implies can, sure, I think lots of oughts imply cans, but does ought as such, for every single x, does that imply that one can do x? It's not clear. By my lights, compatibilism might be true, it's an epistemic possibility. In which case, free will would be compatible with being causally determined. But if we are causally determined, well then it's plausible that we don't have the ability to do otherwise. But nevertheless, we're still free and responsible for what we do. And so, if we're free and responsible for what we do, we can be blamed for it, and it can truthfully be said that we ought not to have done it. So even if compatibilism is true, it's still true that Hitler, for instance, ought not to have persecuted the Jews. But yet, if compatibilism is true, Hitler could not have done otherwise. So we have Hitler ought to have refrained from killing the Jews, and yet Hitler couldn't have refrained from killing the Jews. Again, assuming compatibilism and assuming moral realism or whatever. So given the compatibilism, or for those privy to debates in philosophy of action, and more strictly speaking, semi-compatibilism. Given that compatibilism might be true, and given that compatibilism would plausibly deliver us a counterexample to this first premise, well then, I think we should be very hesitant to accept this first premise, at least by my lights. Of course, you might think that compatibilism doesn't even have a chance of being true, but for me, I definitely think it has a chance of being true, and in that case, my credence in one is correspondingly lowered. That's, that's the moral gap that, that John here talks about. And it gives him this following argument. If one ought to do X, then one can do X. That's pretty much an indisputable principle of ethics. That's not true. That principle has come under tremendous fire in metaethics and ethics. There are lots of papers published that challenge whether ought implies can. One ought to live up to the demands of morality. Uh, so it follows that one can live up to the demands of morality. But one can live up to the demands of morality only if one has the requisite extra human assistance. So one does have. Yeah, so I think premise four is just implausible. The naturalist thinks, yeah, we should live up to the demands of morality, and so we can, but of course there is no extra human assistance, so the demands of morality, 
only require us to do things that are possible for humans to do on their own. Whether or not someone accepts four seems to be a function entirely of one's prior commitments. No one who doesn't already accept something like theism, or at least no one who doesn't already reject atheism, would be in a position to accept four, it seems. Of the extra human assistance. And similarly, we say that if a theory postulates exactly the extra human assistance needed to live up to the demands of morality, it's rational to accept that theory. Christ Again, we saw earlier why that is very implausible. Indeed, it arguably seems clearly false. Even if satisfying this antecedent here counts in favor of a theory, again, which is questionable, there could be defeaters and countervailing considerations which renders it not rational to believe the relevant theory. I, I've already criticized six earlier, and I talked about, again, Judaism, Islam, Baranon, religious theism, and so on. So anyway, let's just continue. Christian theism does postulate exactly the extra human assistance needed to live up to the demands of morality. Uh, and, and there he has in mind um, the Christian doc doctrines of uh, atonement, justification, and sanctification. So it's rational to believe Christian theism. Kant on the duty <laughs> to promote the highest good. Kant factors in a lot of moral arguments. Now, by highest good, Kant means perfect proportionment of happiness to virtue. So uh, you're happy in like the eudaimonistic sense, like flourishing, you flourish uh, to the extent that you're virtuous. Okay, that's what he means by the highest good. So we ought morally to promote the realization of the highest good. What we ought to do must be possible for us to do. It's possible for us to promote the realization of the highest good only if there's a God who makes that possible for us. Um, and so because only God could ensure the perfect proportionment of happiness to virtue. So God exists. Okay, so what's interesting, Bremus 4 is saying, if it's possible for us to promote the realization of the highest good, then there exists a God who makes the realization possible. But notice that there's a discrepancy here. We're talking about we ought to promote the realization of the highest good. It's not saying that we ought to realize the highest good. It's saying we ought to promote the realization of the highest good. And that only entails that we can, again, given ought implies can, which is contestable, but that only implies that we can promote the realization of the highest good. Then why would that require God who makes the realization possible, right? All we need to be possible here is the promotion of realizing the highest good. So even if God is required to make the realization of the highest good possible, it's not at all clear that God is required to make the promotion of the realization of the highest good possible. And indeed, it seems as though it could be possible to promote the realization of the highest good, even if the very realization of the highest good is not possible. You can still try to promote it. We can still, for instance, try to promote world peace, even if, maybe given the limitations of human nature, world peace ultimately cannot be realized. Still, we can promote it, and we ought to promote it, and so on. So, premise four here is implausible. It's not clear whether premise one is true either. It depends probably on what the highest good is. Suppose that the highest good is like so good that it's beyond our natural capacities even to promote. Well, then in that case, the naturalist who accepts that ought implies can would never grant that we ought to promote the highest good. And of course, in that case, the argument is utterly powerless to move naturalists. Only those antecedently accepting the supernatural would be convinced of the argument. By contrast, suppose the highest good is not beyond our natural capacities to promote. Well, then in that case, premise four, once again, is false. So either way, the argument simply fails. Moreover, it's not clear whether premise two is true. There are several challenges to the principle that ought implies can, like the compatibilist challenge that I rendered earlier. And again, I've given a reason to be very skeptical of premise four here, but here are some others. We can ask, what is the highest good? Perhaps it's something like just a flourishing life, a life full of intellectual and moral virtue, a life in which the person knows important truths about reality, has a good character, acts morally, and all around achieves various excellences that humans can achieve. Well, that doesn't require God to facilitate its realization. Kant might try to define the highest good or the realization of the highest good as perfect proportionment of happiness to virtue, but then we can just ask, why? Why is that the highest good? Give me some reason to think that that's the highest good as opposed to the thing that I just laid out. And finally, what I want to say is yet another challenge to premise four. Why would it require God specifically to facilitate its realization? Why not just some sort of supernatural help? Like maybe an angel would do. Maybe an angel is able to realize the proportionment of happiness and virtue, the correct, accurate proportionment of them. Or maybe it's just some superhuman power, something like Zeus, or something like a kind of karma, or something like a law of nature that ensures that. Again, these other sorts of hypotheses might be intrinsically improbable, but so is the hypothesis that there is a god who makes this realization possible. It's not wrong. And duty. Yeah. Uh, this should be a familiar argument. Uh, we have objective moral applications. If we do, then they're best understood as divine commands. That was the subject of Robert Adams' uh, unsurpassed book uh, on theistic ethics, Finite and Infinite Goods. Uh, so objective moral obligations are best understood as divine commands. But if they are, then uh, God exists, so God exists. <laughs> God exists.
Okay, so I find premise two implausible, of course, and I find it inadequately motivated, moreover. The first problem with it is, again, um, when God is making his various commands, like we ought not to rape, he either has some reason to make that command, or he has no reason to make the command. If he has some reason to make the command, like, say, because raping someone is bad or because of the suffering that the person undergoes, well then surely it's that reason which is doing the explanatory heavy lifting with respect to generating the moral obligation. In which case, God's commanding it, God is kind of like just an intermediary here. He's not doing any explanatory heavy lifting with respect to one's obligation not to do it. All you need to ground or explain the objective moral obligation not to rape would just be that further reason. Let's say facts about the victim and the suffering that the victim experiences and facts about what it is to rape someone. But by contrast, on the other horn of the dilemma, suppose that God has no reason to forbid this or to command us not to do this, well then it's completely arbitrary, right? And of course that's absurd. Plausibly, if obligations are just entirely arbitrary, then they don't have any normative authority over us. And moreover, it's just patently false in its own. It's just false to say that it's arbitrary that rape, for instance, is wrong. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that, again, there are alternative explanations that enjoy, it seems, greater parsimony and explanatory power. Again, to ground objective moral obligations and duties, you need only cite various facts intrinsic to the act or the situation or the victims of the act and so on. You can talk about the suffering of the victim, you can talk about the rights of the victim, maybe you can talk about the utility involved. You can cite boatloads of facts intrinsic to the situation that stands independently ground its impermissibility. And you can also talk about the nature of the action itself, like the very nature of promise making or the very nature of non-consensual sex and so on. So again, there are alternative explanations that don't involve divine commands that seem to be firstly importantly simpler, and at least by my lights, also seem to enjoy greater explanatory power. But all I want to point out here is that there are alternative explanations. The third problem is, of course, Eric Wielenberg's example of lifting a, a pinky finger. If you could lift a pinky finger to prevent a million holocaust, it seems as though that very fact makes it morally obligatory for you to lift your pinky finger or whatever. It doesn't matter if God commanded you or not. It seems as though the very fact of the situation that you can, just by doing this thing at very little to no inconvenience to yourself, prevent millions of holocausts and that pr profound suffering and badness that would ensue therefrom. It seems as though that alone would be sufficient to generate uh, a stance independent moral obligation for you to lift your pinky finger. It doesn't matter whether or not God has commanded you. Since premise two would imply the opposite of that, it would imply that, nope, you literally are not morally obliged to lift your pinky finger unless, unless God just so happens to have commanded you to do so. No, that just seems utterly implausible. And then the fourth problem, which I'm not going to develop in any detail here, but Wielenberg develops a kind of psychopath argument, which is kind of interesting. Basically, objective moral obligations and duties that are generated by commands only oblige the people to which the command is made if the command is made sufficiently known to them, if I just whisper under my breath to my child, let's say, you have, you ought to clean your room or something like that so that the child doesn't hear it, it would be absurd to then blame my child and say, oh no, you didn't live up to your obligation. Like what? I didn't even properly communicate it to the child. But of course, psychopaths, given their constitution, it seems as though they're either not able to grasp or they're somehow out of touch with the moral obligations and duties. And so this divine command theory of moral obligations and duties would seem to entail that psychopaths don't, after all, have any moral obligations which seems absurd, right? Surely they are still morally obliged, let's say, not to dismember people and torture them. Now anyway, much, much, much more can be said both back and forth on these various arguments and so on, but I'm just giving you some of the reasons that I've found at least reasonably plausible that make me reject premise two here, and I guess the argumentative approach here more generally. And you'll see in arguments from obligations and duty, they often talk about how objective obligations and duty, a reason for thinking that there are such is that, let me just give you a quick example. Um, we just had a bunch of snow uh, the past few weeks here in Ohio. So at one point it was up to you know 18 inches. And my wife has to get up very early for work to leave, sometimes at like 5.30 in the morning. And I could sleep in till the baby wakes up at like 9 o'clock. But uh, she can't get out of the driveway if I don't get out and, and, and clear it. Um, you know, sometimes there's maybe not, you know, there could be just a little bit, just enough snow to where she could drive over. I could get away with like staying in bed. Uh, but there's just something pulling me. I really feel like a, a genuine almost physical tension that pushes me out of bed to go shuffle that driveway. That's just the right thing to do. So uh, moral obligations and duties often have this feeling of, of pushing and pulling people to behave in certain ways, which... Well, it's not clear that it's the moral obligation or duty which is like pulling you or pushing you in some manner. It seems to be your psychological dispositions and so on, and the, the character that you've built up over the years. That's not to say that there aren't objective moral obligations and so on. I actually think that there probably are. I'm just taking issue with the way that he's described the situation here. Yeah, the explanation, of course, is in terms of your character that you've built up over the years and your psychological dispositions and desires and so on. And, of course, potentially fear of the wife's retribution. Humans, argument from, humans argument from conscience. Uh, conscience. Uh, guilt, shame, responsibility, 
and so on are only appropriately felt in relation to other moral agents. But sometimes we have- So I think that premise is implausible. The very fact of transgressing a moral maxim legitimates or renders appropriate responsibility and guilt and shame and so on, it seems. It doesn't matter if there are other moral agents. It's the very fact that you've transgressed a moral maxim or the, the very fact that you've done something you ought not to have done. That is what legitimates or renders appropriate responsibility and guilt and shame and so on. It doesn't matter if there are other moral agents around, so it seems. Indeed, we can even agree with the spirit behind one, but simply reject the quote-unquote other constraint. It's not the case that it's only appropriately felt in relation to other moral agents. Sure, it's appropriately felt only in relation to moral agents, but perhaps that moral agent is yourself. It seems as though you, you could easily appropriately and legitimately feel guilt and shame and responsibility, etc., in relation just to yourself. So again, those are the two reasons why we can reject premise one. Responsibility and so on are only appropriately felt in relation to other moral agents. But sometimes we appropriately feel guilt, shame, responsibility for deeds done in secret that harm. <laughs> I see where your mind is going. Deeds done in secret. Mm -hmm. uh, so guilt, shame, and responsibility for deeds done in secret are appropriately felt only if there's another moral agent that's privy to deeds done in secret. Uh, so there is a moral agent that's privy to deeds done in secret. The best explanation of that is if there's a godlike being, so there is a godlike being. So premise five, it's not clear to me why that's true, and it seems somewhat implausible. It could be all other sorts of moral agents. Maybe there are, again, maybe there are aliens monitoring us from afar, and so are privy to our deeds done in secret, mm -hmm, whatever those might be. Uh, maybe there are angels that are privy to our deeds done in secret. Maybe there's some Zeus-like supernatural character that's privy to our deeds done in secret, and so on down the line of, like, the infinitely many possible agents that it could be. Why think that God is more plausible than any of those? Of course you're going to say something like, well, aliens, that's really intrinsically improbable, but at least we know that there are physical beings in the universe that are intelligent and so on, and we know that the universe is sufficiently huge and so on, like, we at least know those things. Those, that's in our background knowledge. That might even be more intrinsically probable than theism. I'm not saying it is, but I'm just saying it's not clear that it isn't. And so again, even if you say that these various other hypotheses, like there being a, a Zeus-like supernatural character that's privy to our deeds, or maybe there being some sort of angel that's privy to our deeds done in private, you might say those have a low prior probability, but I'm just going to turn around and say, yes, but that's the exact same thing as a god that's privy to our deeds done in secret. Again, it might just be something which even has a comparable prior probability to God's existence, like an aesthetic deism hypothesis that Paul Draper has talked about, or just even something that's exactly like God, except it's more properties, it's morally indifferent. There are boatloads of other alternative hypotheses, at least many of which even seem to be as intrinsically likely as theism. Super interesting. I've never heard of this argument, uh, but I definitely want to think more about it. That's why I'm kind of pulling this up right now. I want to see what kind of uh, additional resources there are. Yeah, so if I remember correctly, I think Graham Oppie objects to this argument by saying, well, no, it doesn't. Guilt, shame, and responsibility don't imply relation to someone else because a relation to yourself is sufficient. You can just, you can feel guilty mm. yourself. And so, uh, well, maybe, maybe so, maybe not. I mean, on the other hand, it's like, there are some scumbags that probably don't feel uh, you know, who, who would just get away with anything and yet realize, maybe you're a psychopath and realize that, yeah, you did do something wrong. So, so you know, just... That is true, but remember what the premise was. The premise was appropriately felt in relation. Arguably, when you're talking about psychopaths and scumbags like that, even if they don't feel guilt and shame and responsibility, and etc., even in relation to themselves, the question is, would it be appropriate for them to? And yes, it would. But, you know, a sophisticated defense of this argument might require a distinction between objective guilt, subjective guilt, things like that. On the intrinsic harmfulness of wrongdoing, Wrongdoing is intrinsically harmful to the wrongdoer, even if they don't feel like it. So harm here means not pain or suffering or guilty conscience, but just having or even having bad character. It just means objective well-being. You are not objectively as good off as as you would be if you hadn't harmed someone or, 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 or done something wrong to, to someone. Um, it, it, metaphorically, wrongdoing is like it's, it's soul withering in a way, but even if it, doesn't, if it doesn't seem to you to be. So wrongdoing is intrinsically harmful to the wrongdoer. That could be true only if harm is the harm here is, is punishment from a godlike being. So here's a godlike being. So premise one is true insofar as wrongdoing intrinsically harms the moral character of the wrongdoer. Yeah. But then premise two seems clearly false. All you need to harm your moral character is to do something wrong for which you are morally responsible. That has nothing to do with punishment from a godlike being. Indeed, the very fact that it's intrinsically harmful seems to militate against the truth of premise two. If it's intrinsically harmful, then it's simply part of the very inner nature of the wrongdoing to harm the one who performs the wrongdoing. But in that case, the source of the harm is the wrongdoing itself, it seems, and its intrinsic character or nature, not some extrinsic relation to a punisher outside the wrongdoer. But perhaps the proponent of this argument has something else in mind. Uh, I mean, maybe. Uh, but in any case, the notion of intrinsic harm is either going to be naturalistically acceptable or not. If it is, then the naturalist would never grant premise two, and so the argument is dialectically toothless and so fails. And if it isn't naturalistically acceptable, well, then again, the naturalist would never grant premise one. And so then the argument is dialectically toothless and so would fail. Either way, the argument fails. These are all really interesting arguments. So this is, this is just really cool. This is really cool. All right, uh, moving, moving on. Moral knowledge. Moral knowledge. Now, moral this is knowledge. an argument that, yeah, this, this is one that I am 
uh, very yeah. This, this shows up in the Blackwell Companion. Uh, the author there, uh, what's his name? Uh, Linvell, Mark Linvell. Uh, we have moral knowledge. If naturalism is true, then we probably don't have moral knowledge. But if theism is true, we probably do. So if we have moral knowledge, that's strong evidence for theism and against naturalism. So moral knowledge is strong evidence for theism and against naturalism. And the main reason for thinking uh, uh, too that uh, are the faculties we use to form moral beliefs aren't wouldn't be aimed at truth, but fitness. If naturalism is true, so it's possible that we could always have. Uh, it's, it's possible that we could have true moral beliefs if if naturalism is true. But it's more likely that those true beliefs would be true by accident. It would be like believing it's noon when you look at the clock that says noon, and it is noon, but yesterday the batteries ran out of the clock uh, and stopped the hands at noon. You know, y you have a true belief that it's noon, but only by accident. Uh, so if naturalism is true, our moral beliefs are true only only by accident. That's the main idea here. I think this would probably require a video in its own right just because of how complicated the argument for moral knowledge is. So there are lots of challenges to premise two in the literature. So Eric Wielenberg, for instance, has a third factor approach wherein he targets premise two and says that, nope, that's not true, or at least we don't have sufficient reason to think that it's true. Russ Chamber Lando, for instance, check out his published works. He's written on this, uh, and he has responses to this sort of line of reasoning. Also see my video with him and Kane B, both of whom actually rejected the principal argument that was just laid out by Chad for thinking that premise two is true, and they also gave reasons for their rejections. So definitely check out that video that I did with Russ Schaefer Landau and Kane B. And also I want to put some resources on your radar for investigating this moral knowledge argument further, because there are some forceful criticisms, or at least potentially forceful criticisms of the argument that I want you guys to be aware of. One of the best places to go here is Challenges to Moral and Religious Belief, Disagreement and Evolution, edited by Michael Bergman and Patrick Kane. Now, of course, a big shout out to Purdue University, boiler up, bro, because Michael Bergman is one of my professors at Purdue University, and Pat Kane is one of my professors at Purdue University. So yeah, bada bing, bada boom. These guys are both amazing. Definitely check out this. Now, the, the relevant chapters that I want to at least put on your radar is this one. And I'm basically just going to briefly talk through this one. By Sharon Street, if everything happens for a reason, then we don't know what reasons are. Why the price of theism is normative skepticism. So she is actually challenging this third premise here. No, if theism is true, then it's false that we very probably would have moral knowledge. We actually very probably wouldn't have moral knowledge. So we're going to go a little bit through her article. But also the article from William Fitzpatrick, Why There Is No Darwinian Dilemma for Ethical Realism. He essentially provides a response to premise two here, that if naturalism is true, then we probably don't have moral knowledge. So definitely check out this book and check out the two chapters in particular that I just mentioned, the one that is chapter 12 by William Fitzpatrick and the one which is chapter nine from Sharon Street. And I, we're just going to go briefly through some of the stuff that Sharon Street writes in her article. So Sharon Street, she is actually one of the defenders of a kind of evolutionary debunking argument of morality. So she's argued elsewhere in a secular meta-ethical context that normative realism, the position that there are robustly mind-independent truths about how to live, faces the following epistemological problem. On the supposition that normative realism is true, we must conclude that in all likelihood we are hopeless at discovering how to live. This skeptical conclusion is so implausible that we are forced to reject the realist supposition that leads to it. In this essay, I explore a structurally analogous argument according to which theism, the position that there is a god in the sense of an omniscient, omnipotent, and morally perfect being, also leads to normative skepticism therefore should likewise be rejected. General strategy of her argument is to suppose with the theist that God exists, and then to argue that this supposition, when coupled with factual observations about the kinds of things that happen in this world, has implausible substantive normative implications concerning the kinds of moral reasons for action that there are. Indeed, to such an extent that on the supposition that theism is true, we must come to distrust our faculty of moral judgment across the board. This skeptical conclusion is unacceptable for a variety of reasons. First, it's extremely implausible, blah blah blah, right? It's unacceptable, basically. It's intolerably unacceptable. <laughs> The argument bears closest resemblance to a line of objection that has been developed against the theistic position known as skeptical theism. According to this line of objection, the skeptical theist cannot successfully contain his or her putatively restricted area of skepticism. Instead, the skepticism inevitably spills out beyond its intended domain and becomes crippling. So she basically begins with what she calls moral common sense. The example she's about to give is disturbing, but if the subject of discussion is evil and what morally to make of it, then it is essential that we have in mind real life cases. Philosophical positions concerning evil that might sound plausible in the abstract need to be tested against reality, whose horrors outstrip on a routine basis anything that one might otherwise have imagined was possible. One among endless possible examples of a horrific real-life evil is a drunk driving accident that occurred in the early morning hours of July 2, 2005 in Long Island, New York. In this accident, a drunk driver traveling 70 miles an hour the wrong way on a highway struck a limousine that was carrying six family members home from a wedding that had taken place earlier that day. In the crash, a seven-year-old girl, who had been a flower girl at the wedding, was decapitated. The limousine driver was also killed on impact, and the flower girl's five-year-old sister, father, and maternal grandparents were critically injured. 
In the minutes that followed, the flower girl's mother, who had also been in the limousine, pulled herself from the wreckage and began searching for her family. She knew that her five-year-old daughter was alive because she could hear her moans, but as she searched the wreckage, she found her seven-year-old daughter's decapitated head. The mother picked it up and clung to it, screaming to her husband that Katie is dead. In spite of repeated requests by emergency personnel, the mother refused to give up her daughter's head, holding onto it for nearly an hour as she watched the rest of her family being cut from the wreckage. The idea that there was a good moral reason to permit this scene of unimaginable horror to take place defies every last shred of moral common sense. This is so in the sense that if there was such a reason, then the moral reality of the world is very different from what our everyday moral and factual capacities are capable of discerning. I assume that no one among the likely readership of this essay would seriously entertain the thought that any of the parties involved deserved this. What then? When we examine the world as we might have thought we knew it, we can find no circumstance, moral, empirical, or otherwise, that would seem to supply any good reason to permit such an event to occur. Importantly, for our purposes, this is not to say that there couldn't be a morally good reason to permit such an event to occur. Of course there could be. There could be a morally good reason to permit anything. But it is to suggest that cleaving to the view that there was a morally good reason to permit this crash to happen, which, as I will argue, belief in God entails, might come at a very high price. It might come in particular at the price of our ability to trust our own faculty of moral judgment going forward. If there was a morally good reason to permit this to happen, in other words, then we are hopeless judges of moral reasons. The rest of this essay consists in a more formal exploration and development of that idea. So basically, we're not going to go through her essay, but I just wanted to make you aware of it. My point here is not to necessarily agree with her argument and not to necessarily disagree with her argument. I'm just showing how these issues are immensely complex and unclear, which inspires in me a deep sense of humility and tentativeness in these sorts of regards. I mean, her case isn't absurd and it needs to be reckoned with, right? It's not implausible what she's arguing. She has a case to be made. Anyone who wants to defend a premise three of this argument here needs to address her case that she makes in that chapter. And similarly, anyone who wants to defend premise two here needs to contend with William Fitzpatrick's chapter in this book as well, the chapter 12 that I was talking about. All right, so anyway, back to this. More resources on that one. Okay, next one. Okay, uh, Richie uh, defends the argument where we have a capacity to apprehend objective moral norms. But if that's true, the best explanation for that is that our cognitive faculties were intended to apprehend objective moral norms. So, uh, our cognitive faculties are intended to apprehend objective moral norms. But if three is true, uh, three is true theism is the best explanation for that. So theism is the best explanation for our having the capacity to apprehend objective moral norms. He defends it pretty similarly. It's quite clear how this argument is not at all going to be independent of the previous argument. I don't want to say that they're identical arguments, but they're basically the same thing. And again, I'm just going to say here that premise two is implausible by my lights. So long as there's a naturalistic account of how our moral faculties reliably track moral reality, and indeed there are several such accounts, one or more of them will be a better explanation than divine intention. They're going to be simpler and they're going to be at least as explanatorily potent. And, of course, accounts in terms of divine intention also face the problems that I previously mentioned, in particular are going to face Sharon Street's argument that she developed in that chapter that we've been going through. So, anyway, let's continue. So, we have two arguments from altruism, where genuine altruism is sacrificial behavior for another. It incurs no benefit to yourself, uh, your relations, or to your social group, okay? Uh, it's exclusively a sacrifice for someone else. Uh all right, so if it incurs no benefits to yourself, then genuine altruism is incompatible with Christian theism, of course, because if you are genuinely altruistic, then it doesn't accrue any benefits to yourself. But of course, what we might think of as sacrificing yourself for others, that is going to accrue benefits to yourself under Christian theism, because you're going to be rewarded in heaven and so on. Indeed, lots of the other arguments in this list said precisely that. And so if genuine altruism exists and is rational according to this first premise, well then Christian theism is false, hence Christian theism is false. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Okay. ...or to your social group, okay? Uh, it's exclusively a sacrifice. Genuine altruism is sacrificial behavior for another. It incurs no benefit to yourself, uh, your relations, or to your social group, okay? Uh, it's exclusively a sacrifice for someone else uh, with no benefit. All right, if, if genuine altruism exists and is rational, that's a key premise. Uh, if naturalism is true, genuine altru altruism does not exist and is irrational. So well, that seems like the key premise to me, arguably. That seems really implausible. Naturalism seems to be a precondition for genuine altruism. Right? Under theism, plausibly, God's going to reward you in some sort of afterlife. I mean, again, theism doesn't strictly entail it, but it might probabilify it. So, yeah, there is no genuine altruism, it seems, under that sort of thing. Yes, you can genuinely sacrifice yourself for others, and maybe you can even sacrifice yourself without expecting some reward, but you're going to get it if God is perfectly good, and he apportions benefits to you based on the good things that you did in your life. And so given the definition of altruism that was given earlier, that can't exist under Christian theism, and it's very unlikely to exist 
under theism. It seems naturalism or something like it is actually a precondition for genuine altruism, because only then can you really truly sacrifice yourself without any benefits incurred from that. So anyway, this is just a very odd argument. Anyway, if we define altruism in the normal sense, where it's just like at least sacrificing something of your own for the sake of others, for helping others, that is perfectly compatible with naturalism. Altruism in that sense can perfectly well exist under naturalism, and it can be rational under naturalism. It can be still perfectly rational because it's intrinsically valuable, let's say. Given that it does exist and is rational, naturalism is false. If theism is true, genuine altruism probably does exist and is rational. So the existence and rationality of genuine altruism strongly confirms theism. I've argued, yeah, that it's precisely the opposite. There's we have a second argument. Them. Yeah, we have a second argument from altruism uh, from Proust, which is that moral altru altruism is irreducibly normative. Um, this one will take a bit of explaining. Just well, let's just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, have... I agree. Uh, there can be no naturalistic explanation for moral altruism if moral altruism is irreducibly normative. So there is no naturalistic explanation for moral altruism. Uh, there are good theistic explanations of moral altruism, however, uh, which is evidence for theism. Well, it's interesting because that premise that he added verbally there, that there are good theistic explanations of moral altruism, is not showing up on the screen. I just take it that maybe they accidentally omitted a premise. So anyway, just note that that should be there on the screen, for those of you who are looking at the screen. There should be an extra premise that says, there are indeed good theistic explanations for moral altruism. What I want to say here is that uh, premise 2 seems to be just clearly false. I've been going through various ways that are non-theistic and perfectly compatible with naturalism that can explain or ground or account for objective normative truths and assuming that those normative truths aren't reducible to non-normative truths and facts, well then we're going to be able to account for that as well in non-theistic terms. So anyway, I don't find two plausible at all. But also, for their implicit premise here that there are good theistic explanations for moral altruism, listen, whatever it is that the theist wants to point to about God to ground the normativity of altruism, they're going to face the same dilemma we've seen crop up time and again for moral arguments. Either there's some underlying reason why God's being that way delivers the normativity of altruism, or there isn't such an underlying reason. If there is, then the naturalist can simply cite that reason. It's that reason which is doing the heavy, explanatory heavy lifting, it seems. If there isn't, then altruism's normativity is just entirely arbitrary, which seems absurd. And moreover, here is a parody argument to this sort of argument. Premise 1, moral altruism is intrinsically normative. That seems plausible. There's something about sacrificing for others in and of itself which is good. That seems to be in and of itself deeply valuable, and it seems to be intrinsically normative as well. Second premise, if moral altruism is intrinsically normative, then something about the altruism itself accounts for its normativity, not some extrinsic relation to God or God's nature. So, conclusion, something about the altruism itself accounts for its normativity, not some extrinsic relation to God or God's nature. And in that case, God isn't needed as an explanation. The naturalist can simply appeal to the intrinsic nature or character of altruism itself to account for its normativity and indeed its irreducible normativity.